Section eleven Dull Knife from Indian Heroes and Great Chieftains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Indian Heroes and Great Chieftains by Charles A. Eastman. Ohiesa. Dull Knife. The life of Dull Knife, the Cheyenne, is a true hero tale. Simple, childlike yet manful, and devoid of selfish aims or love of gain, he is a pattern for heroes of any race. Dull Knife was a chief of the old school. Among all the Indians of the plains, nothing counts save proven worth. A man's caliber is measured by his courage, unselfishness, and intelligence. Many writers confuse history with fiction. But in Indian history their women and old men, and even children, witness the main events, and not being absorbed in daily papers and magazines, these events are rehearsed over and over with few variations. Though orally preserved, their accounts are therefore accurate. But they have seldom been willing to give reliable information to strangers, especially when asked and paid for. Racial prejudice naturally enters into the account of a man's life by enemy writers, while one is likely to favor his own race. I am conscious that many readers may think that I have idealized the Indian. Therefore, I will confess now that we have too many weak and unprincipled men among us. When I speak of the Indian hero, I do not forget the mongrel in spirit, faults to the ideals of his people. Our trustfulness has been our weakness, and when the vices of civilization were added to our own, we fell heavily. It is said that Dull Knife, as a boy, was resourceful and self-reliant. He was only nine years old when his family was separated from the rest of the tribe while on a buffalo hunt. His father was away and his mother busy, and he was playing with his little sister on the banks of a stream when a large herd of buffalo swept down upon them on a stampede for water. His mother climbed a tree, but the little boy led his sister into an old beaver house whose entrance was above water, and here they remained in shelter until the buffalo passed and they were found by their distracted parents. Dull Knife was quite a youth when his tribe was caught one winter in a region devoid of game and threatened with starvation. This situation was made worse by heavy storms, but he secured help and led a relief party a hundred and fifty miles, carrying bales of dried buffalo meat on pack horses. Another exploit that made him dear to his people occurred in battle, when his brother-in-law was severely wounded and left lying where no one on either side dared to approach him. As soon as Dull Knife heard of it, he got on a fresh horse and made so daring a charge that others joined him. Thus, under cover of their fire, he rescued his brother-in-law, and in so doing was wounded twice. The suit knew him as a man of high type, perhaps not so brilliant as Roman Nose or Two Moon, but surpassing both in honesty and simplicity, as well as in his war record. Two Moon, in fact, was never a leader of his people, and became distinguished only in wars with the whites during the period of revolt. A story is told of an ancestor of the same name that illustrates well the spirit of the age. It was the custom in those days for the older men to walk ahead of the moving caravan and decide upon all halts and camping places. One day the councillors came to a grove of wild cherries covered with ripe fruit, and they stopped at once. Suddenly a grizzly charged from the thicket. The men yelped and hooted, but the bear was not to be bluffed. He knocked down the first warrior who dared to face him, and dragged his victim into the bushes. The whole caravan was in the wildest excitement. Several of the swiftest-footed warriors charged the bear, to bring him out into the open, while the women and dogs made all the noise they could. The bear accepted the challenge, and as he did so, the man whom they had supposed dead came running from the opposite end of the thicket. The Indians were delighted, and especially so, when in the midst of their cheers, the man stopped running for his life and began to sing a Braveheart song, as he approached the grove with his butcher knife in his hand. He would dare his enemy again. The grizzly met him with a tremendous rush, and they went down together. Instantly, the bear began to utter cries of distress, and at the same time the knife flashed, and he rolled over dead. The warrior was too quick for the animal. 
He first bit his sensitive nose to distract his attention, and then used the knife to stab him to the heart. He fought many battles with knives thereafter, and claimed that the spirit of the bear gave him success. On one occasion, however, the enemy had a strong buffalo hide shield, which the Cheyenne bear fighter could not pierce through, and he was wounded. Nevertheless, he managed to dispatch his foe. It was from this incident that he received the name of Dull Knife, which was handed down to his descendant. As is well known, the northern Cheyennes uncompromisingly supported the Sioux in their desperate defense of the Black Hills and Big Horn country. Why not? It was their buffalo region, their subsistence. It was what our wheat fields are to a civilized nation. About the year 1875, a propaganda was started for confining all the Indians upon reservations, where they would be practically interned or imprisoned, regardless of their possessions and rights. The men who were the strongest advocates of the scheme generally wanted the Indians' property, the one main cause back of all Indian wars. From the warlike Apaches to the peaceful Nez Perce, all the tribes of the plains were hunted from place to place. Then the government resorted to peace negotiations, but always with an army at hand to coerce. Once disarmed and helpless, they were to be taken under military guard to the Indian Territory. A few resisted and declared they would fight to the death rather than go. Among these were the Sioux but nearly all the smaller tribes were deported against their wishes. Of course, those Indians who came from a mountainous and cold country suffered severely. The moist heat and malaria decimated the exiles. Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce and Chief Standing Bear of the Poncas appealed to the people of the United States and finally succeeded in having their bands, or the remnant of them, return to their own part of the country. Dull Knife was not successful in his plea, and the story of his flight is one of poignant interest. He was regarded by the authorities as a dangerous man, and with his depleted band was taken to the Indian Territory without his consent in 1876. When he realized that his people were dying like sheep, he was deeply moved. He called them together. Every man and woman declared that they would rather die in their own country than stay there longer and they resolved to flee to their northern homes. Here again was displayed the genius of these people. From the Indian Territory to Dakota is no short dash for freedom. They knew what they were facing. Their line of flight lay through a settled country, and they would be closely pursued by the army. No sooner had they started than the telegraph wire sang one song. The panther of the Cheyennes is at large. Not a child or a woman in Kansas or Nebraska is safe. Yet they evaded all the pursuing and intercepting troops and reached their native soil. The strain was terrible, the hardship great, and Dull Knife, like Joseph, was remarkable for his self-restraint in sparing those who came within his power on the way. But fate was against him, for there were those looking for blood money who betrayed him when he thought he was among friends. His people were tired out and famished when they were surrounded and taken to Fort Robinson. There the men were put in prison and their wives guarded in camp. They were allowed to visit their men on certain days. Many of them had lost everything. There were but a few who had even one child left. They were heartbroken. These despairing women appealed to their husbands to die fighting. Their liberty was gone, their homes broken up and only slavery and gradual extinction in sight. At last Dull Knife listened. He said, I have lived my life. I am ready. The others agreed. If our women are willing to die with us, who is there to say no? If we are to do the deeds of men, it rests with you women to bring us our weapons. As they had been allowed to carry moccasins and other things to the men, so they contrived to take in some guns and knives under this disguise. The plan was to kill the sentinels and run to the nearest natural trench, there to make their last stand. The women and children were to join them. This arrangement was carried out. Not every brave had a gun, but all had agreed to die together. They fought till their small store of ammunition was exhausted then exposed their broad chests for a target, and the mothers even held up their little ones to be shot. 
Thus died the fighting Cheyennes and their dauntless leader. End of section 11「Twelve Roman Nose from Indian Heroes and Great Chieftains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Indian Heroes and Great Chieftains by Charles A. Eastman, Ohiesa. Roman Nose. This Cheyenne war chief was a contemporary of Dull Knife. He was not so strong a character as the other, and was inclined to be pompous and boastful. But with all this, he was a true type of Native American in spirit and bravery. While Dull Knife was noted in warfare among Indians, Roman Nose made his record against the whites, in defense of territory embracing the Republican and Arikari rivers. He was killed on the latter river in 1868 in the celebrated battle with General Forsyth. Save Chief Gall and Washaki in the prime of their manhood, this chief had no peer in bodily perfection and masterful personality. No Greek or Roman gymnast was ever a finer model of physical beauty and power. He thrilled his men to frenzied action when he came upon the field. It was said of him that he sacrificed more youths by his personal influence in battle than any other leader, being very reckless himself in grandstand charges. He was killed needlessly in this manner. Roman Nose always rode an uncommonly fine, spirited horse, and with his war bonnet and other paraphernalia gave a wonderful exhibition. The Indians used to say that the soldiers must gaze at him rather than aim at him, as they so seldom hit him even when running the gauntlet before a firing line. He did a remarkable thing once when on a one-arrow-to-kill buffalo hunt with his brother-in-law. His companion had selected his animal, and drew so powerfully on his sinew bowstring that it broke. Roman Nose had killed his own cow, and was whipping up close to the other when the misfortune occurred. Both horses were going at full speed, and the arrow jerked up in the air. Roman Nose caught it, and shot the cow for him. Another curious story told of him is to the effect that he had an intimate Sioux friend who was courting a Cheyenne girl, but without success. As the wooing of both Sioux and Cheyennes was pretty much all effected in the night-time, Roman Nose told his friend to let him do the courting for him. He arranged with the young woman to elope the next night, and to spend the honeymoon among his Sioux friends. He then told his friend what to do. The Sioux followed instructions, and carried off the Cheyenne maid, and not until morning did she discover her mistake. It is said she never admitted it, and that the two lived happily together to a good old age, so perhaps there was no mistake after all. Perhaps no other chief attacked more immigrants going west on the Oregon Trail between 1860 and 1868. He once made an attack on a large party of Mormons, and in this instance the Mormons had time to form a corral with their wagons and shelter their women, children, and horses. The men stood outside and met the Indians with well-aimed volleys, but they circled the wagons with whirlwind speed, and whenever a white man fell, it was the signal for Roman Nose to charge and count the coup. The hat of one of the dead men was off, and although he had heavy hair and beard, the top of his head was bald from the forehead up. As custom required such a deed to be announced on the spot, the chief yelled at the top of his voice, Your Roman Nose has counted the first coup on the longest-faced white man who was ever killed. When the northern Cheyennes, under this daring leader, attacked a body of scouting troops under the brilliant officer, General Forsyth, Romanos thought that he had a comparatively easy task. The first onset failed, and the command entrenched itself on a little island. The wily chief thought he could stampede them, and urged on his braves with a declaration that the first to reach the island should be entitled to wear a trailing war bonnet. Nevertheless, he was disappointed, and his men received such a warm reception that none succeeded in reaching it. In order to inspire them to desperate deeds, he had led them in person, and with him that meant victory or death. According to the army accounts, it was a thrilling moment, and might well have proved disastrous to the Forsyth command, whose leader was wounded and helpless. The danger was acute until Roman Nose fell and even then his lieutenants were bent upon crossing at any cost, but some of the older chiefs prevailed upon them to withdraw. 
thus the brilliant war-chief of the cheyennes came to his death if he had lived until eighteen seventy six sitting bull would have had another bold ally End of section twelve chief joseph from indian heroes and great chieftains this librivox recording is in the public domain indian heroes and great chieftains by charles a eastman ohiesa chief joseph the nez perce tribe of indians like other tribes too large to be united under one chief was composed of several bands each distinct in sovereignty it was a loose confederacy Joseph and his people occupied the Imnaha and Grand Ronde Valley in Oregon, which was considered perhaps the finest land in that part of the country. When the last treaty was entered into by some of the bands of the Nez Perce, Joseph's band was at Lapway, Idaho, and had nothing to do with the agreement. The elder chief, in dying, had counseled his son, then not more than twenty-two or twenty-three years of age, never to part with their home assuring him that he had signed no papers. These peaceful, non-treaty Indians did not even know what land had been ceded until the agent read them the government order to leave. Of course they refused. You and I would have done the same. When the agent failed to move them, he and the would-be settlers called upon the army to force them to be good, namely, without a murmur to leave their pleasant inheritance in the hands of a crowd of greedy grafters. General O. O. Howard, the Christian soldier, was sent to do the work. He had a long council with Joseph and his leading men, telling them that they must obey the order or be driven out by force. We may be sure that he presented this hard alternative reluctantly. Joseph was a mere youth without experience in war or public affairs. He had been well brought up in obedience to parental wisdom, and with his brother Ollicott had attended Missionary Spalding's school, where they had listened to the story of Christ and his religion of brotherhood. He now replied in his simple way that neither he nor his father had ever made any treaty disposing of their country, that no other band of the Nez Perce was authorized to speak for them, and it would seem a mighty injustice and unkindness to dispossess a friendly band. General Howard told them, in effect, that they had no rights, no voice in the matter. They had only to obey. Although some of the lesser chiefs counseled revolt then and there, Joseph maintained his self-control, seeking to calm his people, and still groping for a peaceful settlement of their difficulties. He finally asked for thirty days' time in which to find and dispose of their stock, and this was granted. Joseph steadfastly held his immediate followers to their promise, but the land-grabbers were impatient, and did everything in their power to bring about an immediate crisis, so as to hasten the eviction of the Indians. Depredations were committed, and finally the Indians, or some of them, retaliated, which was just what their enemies had been looking for. There might be a score of white men murdered among themselves on the frontier, and no outsider would ever hear about it. But if one were injured by an Indian, down with the bloodthirsty savages, was the cry. Joseph told me himself that during all of those thirty days a tremendous pressure was brought upon him by his own people to resist the government order. The worst of it was, said he, that everything they said was true. Besides, he paused for a moment, it seemed very soon for me to forget my father's dying words, Do not give up our home. Knowing as I do just what this would mean to an Indian, I felt for him deeply. Among the opposition leaders were two Hull Hull Salt, White Bird, and Looking Glass, all of them strong men and respected by the Indians, while on the other side were men built up by emissaries of the government for their own purpose and advertised as great friendly chiefs. As a rule, such men are unworthy and this is so well known to the Indians that it makes them distrustful of the government's sincerity at the start. Moreover, while Indians unqualifiedly say what they mean, the whites have a hundred ways of saying what they do not mean. The center of the storm was this simple young man, who so far as I can learn had never been upon the warpath, and he stood firm for peace and obedience. As for his father's sacred dying charge, 
he told himself that he would not sign any papers. He would not go of his free will, but from compulsion, and this was his excuse. However, the whites were unduly impatient to clear the coveted valley, and by their insolence they aggravated to the danger point an already strained situation. The murder of an Indian was the climax, and this happened in the absence of the young chief. He returned to find the leaders determined to die fighting. The nature of the country was in their favor, and at last they could give the army a chase, but how long they could hold out, they did not know. Even Joseph's younger brother, Ollicott, was won over. There was nothing for him to do but fight, and then and there began the peaceful Joseph's career as a general of unsurpassed strategy in conducting one of the most masterly retreats in history. This is not my judgment, but the unbiased opinion of men whose knowledge and experience fit them to render it. Bear in mind that these people were not scalp-hunters like the Sioux, Cheyennes, and Utes, but peaceful hunters and fishermen. The first council of war was a strange business to Joseph. He had only this to say to his people. I have tried to save you from suffering and sorrow. Resistance means all of that. We are few. They are many. You can see all we have at a glance. They have food and ammunition in abundance. We must suffer great hardship and loss. After this speech, he quietly began his plans for the defense. The main plan of campaign was to engineer a successful retreat into Montana, and there form a junction with the hostile Sioux and Cheyennes under Sitting Bull. There was a relay scouting system, one set of scouts leaving the main body at evening, and the second a little before daybreak, passing the first set on some commanding hilltop. There were also decoy scouts set to trap Indian scouts of the army. I noticed that General Howard charges his Crow scouts with being unfaithful. Their greatest difficulty was in meeting an unencumbered army, while carrying their women, children, and old men, with supplies and such household effects as were absolutely necessary. Joseph formed an auxiliary corps that was to effect a retreat at each engagement, upon a definite plan and in definite order, while the unencumbered women were made into an ambulance corps to take care of the wounded. It was decided that the main rear guard should meet General Howard's command in White Bird Canyon, and every detail was planned in advance yet left flexible according to Indian custom, giving each leader freedom to act according to circumstances. Perhaps no better ambush was ever planned than the one Chief Joseph set for the shrewd and experienced General Howard. He expected to be hotly pursued, but he calculated that the pursuing force would consist of not more than two hundred and fifty soldiers. He prepared false trails to mislead them into thinking that he was about to cross, or had crossed, the Salmon River, which he had no thought of doing at that time. Some of the tents were pitched in plain sight, while the women and children were hidden on the inaccessible ridges, and the men concealed in the canyon, ready to fire upon the soldiers with deadly effect, with scarcely any danger to themselves. They could even roll rocks upon them. In a very few minutes, the troops had learned a lesson. The soldiers showed some fight, but a large body of frontiersmen who accompanied them were soon in disorder. The warriors chased them nearly ten miles, securing rifles and much ammunition, and killing and wounding many. The Nez Perce next crossed the river, made a detour, and recrossed it at another point, then took their way eastward. All this was by way of delaying pursuit. Joseph told me that he estimated it would take six or seven days to get a sufficient force in the field to take up their trail, and the correctness of his reasoning is apparent from the facts as detailed in General Howard's book. He tells us that he waited six days for the arrival of men from various forts in his department, then followed Joseph with six hundred soldiers, beside a large number of citizen volunteers and his Indian scouts. As it was evident they had a long chase over trackless wilderness in prospect, he discarded his supply wagons and took pack mules instead, but by this time the Indians had a good start. Meanwhile, General Howard had sent a dispatch to Colonel Gibbons with orders to head Joseph off, which he undertook to do at the Montana end of the Lolo Trail. The wily commander had no knowledge of this move, 
but he was not to be surprised. He was too brainy for his pursuers, whom he constantly outwitted, and only gave battle when he was ready. There at the Big Hole Pass he met Colonel Gibbons's fresh troops and pressed them close. He sent a party under his brother Ollicott to harass Gibbons's rear and rout the pack mules, thus throwing him on the defensive and causing him to send for help while Joseph continued his masterly retreat toward the Yellowstone Park, then a wilderness. However, this was but little advantage to him, since he must necessarily leave a broad trail, and the army was augmenting its columns day by day with celebrated scouts, both white and Indian. The two commands came together, and although General Howard says their horses were by this time worn out, and by inference the men as well, they persisted on the trail of a party encumbered by women and children, the old, sick, and wounded. It was decided to send a detachment of cavalry under Bacon to Tash Pass, the gateway of the National Park, which Joseph would have to pass, with orders to detain him there until the rest could come up with them. Here is what General Howard says of the affair. Bacon got into position soon enough, but he did not have the heart to fight the Indians on account of their number. Meanwhile, another incident had occurred. Right under the eyes of the chosen scouts and vigilant sentinels, Joseph's warriors fired upon the army camp at night and ran off with their mules. He went straight on toward the park, where Lieutenant Bacon let him get by and pass through a narrow gateway without firing a shot. Here again, it was demonstrated that General Howard could not depend upon the volunteers, many of whom had joined him in the chase, and were going to show the soldiers how to fight the Indians. In this night attack at Camas Meadow, they were demoralized, and while crossing the river next day, many lost their guns in the water, whereupon all packed up and went home, leaving the army to be guided by the Indian scouts. However, this succession of defeats did not discourage General Howard, who kept on with as many of his men as were able to carry a gun. Meanwhile, sending dispatches to all the frontier posts with orders to intercept Joseph if possible. Sturgis tried to stop him as the Indians entered the park, but they did not meet until he was about to come out, when there was another fight, with Joseph again victorious. General Howard came upon the battlefield soon afterward, and saw that the Indians were off again, and from here he sent fresh messages to General Miles, asking for reinforcements. Joseph had now turned northeastward toward the upper Missouri. He told me that when he got into that part of the country, he knew he was very near the Canadian line, and could not be far from Sitting Bull, with whom he desired to form an alliance. He also believed that he had cleared all the forts. Therefore he went more slowly and tried to give his people some rest. Some of their best men had been killed or wounded in battle, and the wounded were a great burden to him. Nevertheless they were carried and tended patiently all during this wonderful flight. Not one was ever left behind. It is the general belief that Indians are cruel and revengeful, and surely these people had reason to hate the race who had driven them from their homes, if any people ever had. Yet it is a fact that when Joseph met visitors and travelers in the park, some of whom were women, he allowed them to pass unharmed, and in at least one instant let them have horses. He told me that he gave strict orders to his men not to kill any women or children. He wished to meet his adversaries according to their own standards of warfare, but he afterward learned that in spite of professions of humanity, white soldiers have not seldom been known to kill women and children indiscriminately. Another remarkable thing about this noted retreat is that Joseph's people stood behind him to a man, and even the women and little boys did each his part. The latter were used as scouts in the immediate vicinity of the camp. The bittersweet valley, which they had now entered, was full of game, and the Indians hunted for food, while resting their worn-out ponies. One morning they had a council to which Joseph rode over bareback, as they had camped in two divisions a little apart. His fifteen-year-old daughter went with him. They discussed sending runners to Sitting Bull to ascertain his exact whereabouts, and whether it would be agreeable to him to join forces with the Nez Perce. 
In the midst of the council, a force of United States cavalry charged down the hill between the two camps. This once, Joseph was surprised. He had seen no trace of the soldiers, and had somewhat relaxed his vigilance. He told his little daughter to stay where she was, and himself cut right through the cavalry and rode up to his own teepee, where his wife met him at the door with his rifle, crying, "'Here is your gun, husband!' The warriors quickly gathered and pressed the soldiers so hard that they had to withdraw. Meanwhile, one set of the people fled while Joseph's own band entrenched themselves in a very favorable position, from which they could not easily be dislodged. General Miles had received and acted on General Howard's message, and he now sent one of his officers with some Indian scouts into Joseph's camp to negotiate with the chief. Meantime, Howard and Sturgis came up with the encampment, and Howard had with him two friendly Nez Perce scouts, who were directed to talk to Joseph in his own language. He decided that there was nothing to do but surrender. He had believed that his escape was all but secure. Then at the last moment he was surprised and caught at a disadvantage. His army was shattered. He had lost most of the leaders in these various fights. His people, including children, women, and the wounded, had traveled thirteen hundred miles in about fifty days, and he himself, a young man who had never before taken any important responsibility. Even now he was not actually conquered. He was well entrenched. His people were willing to die fighting. But the army of the United States offered peace, and he agreed, as he said, out of pity for his suffering people. Some of his warriors still refused to surrender, and slipped out of the camp at night and through the lines. Joseph had, as he told me, between three and four hundred fighting men in the beginning, which means over one thousand persons, and of these several hundred surrendered with him. His own story of the conditions he made was prepared by himself with my help in 1897, when he came to Washington to present his grievances. I sat up with him nearly all of one night, and I may add here that we took the document to General Miles, who was then stationed in Washington, before presenting it to the department. The general said that every word of it was true. In the first place, his people were to be kept at Fort Keogh, Montana, over the winter, and then returned to their reservation. Instead, they were taken to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and placed between a lagoon and the Missouri River where the sanitary conditions made havoc with them. Those who did not die were then taken to the Indian Territory, where the health situation was even worse. Joseph appealed to the government again and again, and at last, with the help of Bishop's Whipple and Hare, he was moved to the Colville Reservation in Washington. Here the land was very poor, unlike their own fertile valley. General Miles said to the chief that he had recommended and urged that their agreement be kept, but the politicians and the people who occupied the Indians' land declared they were afraid if he returned, he would break out again and murder innocent white settlers. What irony! The great Chief Joseph died broken-spirited and broken-hearted. He did not hate the whites, for there was nothing small about him and when he laid down his weapons, he would not fight on with his mind. But he was profoundly disappointed in the claims of a Christian civilization. I call him great, because he was simple and honest. Without education or special training, he demonstrated his ability to lead and to fight when justice demanded. He outgeneraled the best and most experienced commanders in the Army of the United States, although their troops were well provisioned well armed, and above all unencumbered. He was great finally, because he never boasted of his remarkable feat. I am proud of him, because he was a true American. End of section 13《Little Wolf》from Indian Heroes and Great Chieftains This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Indian Heroes and Great Chieftains by Charles A. Eastman, Ohiesa Little Wolf If any people ever fought for liberty and justice, it was the Cheyennes. If any ever demonstrated their physical and moral courage beyond cavil, 
it was this race of purely american heroes among whom little wolf was a leader i knew the chief personally very well as a young doctor i was sent to the pine ridge agency in eighteen ninety as government physician to the sioux and the northern cheyennes while i heard from his own lips of that gallant dash of his people from their southern exile to their northern home i prefer that americans should read of it in dr george bird grinnell's book the fighting cheyennes no account could be clearer or simpler and then too the author cannot be charged with a bias in favor of his own race at the time that i knew him little wolf was a handsome man with the native dignity and gentleness musical voice and a pleasant address of so many brave leaders of his people one day when he was dining with us at our home on the reservation i asked him as i had a habit of doing for some reminiscences of his early life he was rather reluctant to speak but a friend who was present contributed the following perhaps i can tell you why it is that he has been a lucky man all his life when quite a small boy the tribe was one winter in want of food and his good mother had saved a small piece of buffalo meat which she solemnly brought forth and placed before him with the remark my son must be patient for when he grows up he will know even harder times than this he had eaten nothing all day and was pretty hungry but before he could lay hands on the meat a starving dog snatched it and bolted from the teepee the mother ran after the dog and brought him back for punishment she tied him to a post and was about to whip him when the boy interfered don't hurt him mother he cried he took the meat because he was hungrier than i am i was told of another kind act of his under trying circumstances while still a youth he was caught out with a party of buffalo hunters in a blinding blizzard they were compelled to lie down side by side in the snowdrifts and it was a day and a night before they could get out the weather turned very cold and when the men arose they were in danger of freezing little wolf pressed his fine buffalo robe upon an old man who was shaking with a chill and himself took the other's thin blanket as a full-grown young man he was attracted by a maiden of his tribe and according to the custom then in vogue the pair disappeared when they returned to the camp as man and wife behold there was great excitement over the affair it seemed that a certain chief had given many presents and paid unmistakable court to the maid with the intention of marrying her and her parents had accepted the presents which meant consent so far as they were concerned but the girl herself had not given consent the resentment of the disappointed suitor was great it was reported in the village that he had openly declared that the young man who defied and insulted him must expect to be punished as soon as little wolf heard of the threats he told his father and friends that he had done only what it is every man's privilege to do tell the chief said he to come out with any weapon he pleases and i will meet him within the circle of lodges he shall either do this or eat his words the woman is not his her people accepted his gifts against her wishes her heart is mine the chief apologized and thus avoided the inevitable duel which would have been a fight to the death the early life of little wolf offered many examples of the dashing bravery characteristic of the cheyennes and inspired the younger men to win laurels for themselves he was still a young man perhaps thirty-five when the most trying crisis in the history of his people came upon them as i know and as dr grinnell's book amply corroborates he was the general who largely guided and defended them in that tragic flight from the indian territory to their northern home i will not discuss the justice of their cause i prefer to quote dr grinnell lest it appear that i am in any way exaggerating the facts they had come he writes from the high dry country of montana and north dakota to the hot and humid indian territory they had come from a country where buffalo and other game were still plentiful to a land where the game had been exterminated immediately on their arrival they were attacked by fever and ague a disease wholly new to them food was scanty and they began to starve the agent testified before a committee of the senate that he never received supplies to subsist the indians for more than nine months in each year 
These people were meat-eaters, but the beef furnished them by the government inspectors was no more than skin and bone. The agent, in describing their sufferings, said, They have lived, and that is about all. The Indians endured this for about a year, and then their patience gave out. They left the agency to which they had been sent, and started north. Though troops were camped close to them, they attempted no concealment of their purpose. Instead, they openly announced that they intended to return to their own country. We have heard much in past years of the march of the Nez Perce under Chief Joseph, but little is remembered of the dull knife outbreak and the march to the north led by Little Wolf. The story of the journey has not been told, but in the traditions of the old army this campaign was notable, and old men who were stationed on the plains forty years ago are apt to tell you, if you ask them, that there never was such another journey since the Greeks marched to the sea. The fugitives pressed constantly northward undaunted, while orders were flying over the wires, and special trains were carrying men and horses to cut them off at all probable points on the different railway lines they must cross. Of the three hundred Indians, sixty or seventy were fighting men, the rest old men, women, and children. An army officer once told me that thirteen thousand troops were hurrying over the country to capture or kill these few poor people who had left their fever-stricken south, and in the face of every obstacle were steadily marching northward. The War Department set all its resources in operation against them, yet they kept on. If troops attacked them, they stopped and fought until they had driven off the soldiers, and then started north again. Sometimes they did not even stop but marched along, fighting as they marched. For the most part they tried, and with success, to avoid conflicts, and had but four real hard fights, in which they lost half a dozen men killed, and about as many wounded. It must not be overlooked that the appeal to justice had first been tried before taking this desperate step. Little Wolf had gone to the agent about the middle of the summer and said to him, this is not a good country for us. We wish to return to our home in the mountains where we were always well. If you have not the power to give permission, let some of us go to Washington and tell them there how it is, or do you write to Washington and get permission for us to go back? Stay one more year, replied the agent, and then we will see what we can do for you. No, said Little Wolf, before another year there will be none left to travel north. We must go now. Soon after this, it was found that three of the Indians had disappeared, and the chief was ordered to surrender ten men as hostages for their return. He refused. Three men, said he, who are traveling over wild country, can hide so that they cannot be found. You would never get back these three, and you would keep my men prisoners always. The agent then threatened if the ten men were not given up, to withhold their rations and starve the entire tribe into submission. He forgot that he was addressing a Cheyenne. These people had not understood that they were prisoners when they agreed to friendly relations with the government and came upon the reservation. Little Wolf stood up and shook hands with all present before making his final deliberate address. Listen, my friends, I am a friend of the white people and have been so for a long time. I do not want to see blood spilt about this agency. I am going north to my own country. If you are going to send your soldiers after me, I wish you would let us get a little distance away. Then, if you want to fight, I will fight you, and we can make the ground bloody at that place. The Cheyenne was not bluffing. He said just what he meant, and I presume the agent took the hint for although the military were there, they did not undertake to prevent the Indians' departure. Next morning, the teepees were pulled down early and quickly. Toward evening of the second day, the scout signaled the approach of troops. Little Wolf called his men together, and advised them under no circumstances to fire until fired upon. An Arapaho scout was sent to them with a message. If you surrender now, you will get your rations and be well treated. After what they had endured, it was impossible not to hear such a promise with contempt. Said Little Wolf, We are going back to our own country. We do not want to fight. 
He was riding still nearer when the soldiers fired, and at a signal the Cheyennes made a charge. They succeeded in holding off the troop for two days, with only five men wounded and none killed, and when the military retreated, the Indians continued northward, carrying their wounded. This sort of thing was repeated again and again. Meanwhile, Little Wolf held his men under perfect control. There were practically no depredations. They secured some boxes of ammunition left behind by retreating troops, and at one point the young men were eager to follow and destroy an entire command who were apparently at their mercy, but their leader withheld them. They had now reached the buffalo country, and he always kept his main object in sight. He was extraordinarily calm. Dr. Grinnell was told by one of his men years afterward, Little Wolf did not seem like a human being. He seemed like a bear. It is true that a man of his type in a crisis becomes spiritually transformed and moves as one in a dream. At the running water, the band divided, Dull Knife going toward Red Cloud Agency. He was near Fort Robinson when he surrendered and met his sad fate. Little Wolf remained all winter in the Sand Hills, where there was plenty of game and no white men. Later he went to Montana, and then to Pine Ridge, where he and his people remained in peace until they were removed to Lame Deer, Montana, and there he spent the remainder of his days. There is a clear sky beyond the clouds of racial prejudice, and in that final court of honor a noble soul like that of Little Wolf has a place. End of section 14「Hole in the Day」from Indian Heroes and Great Chieftains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Indian Heroes and Great Chieftains by Charles A. Eastman. Ohiesa. Hole in the Day. I wish to thank Rev. C. H. Bolio of Lesur, Minnesota, for much of the material used in this chapter. In the beginning of the nineteenth century, the Indian nations of the Northwest first experienced the pressure of civilization. At this period there was among them some brilliant leaders unknown to history, for the curious reason that they cordially received and welcomed the newcomers rather than opposed them. The only difficulties were those arising among the European nations themselves, and often involving the native tribes. Thus, new environments brought new motives, and our temptations were increased many-fold with the new weapons, new goods, and above all the subtly destructive spirit water. Gradually it became known that the new race had a definite purpose, and that purpose was to chart and possess the whole country, regardless of the rights of its earlier inhabitants. Still the old chiefs cautioned their people to be patient, for, said they, the land is vast, both races can live on it, each in their own way. Let us therefore befriend them and trust to their friendship. While they reasoned thus, the temptations of graft and self-aggrandizement overtook some of the leaders. Hole in the Day, or Bogone Kishig, was born in the opening days of this era. The word Kishig means either day or sky, and the name is perhaps more correctly translated Hole in the Sky. This gifted man inherited his name and much of his ability from his father, who was a war chief among the Ojibways, a Napoleon of the common people, and who carried on a relentless warfare against the Sioux. And yet, as was our custom at the time, peaceful meetings were held every summer, at which representatives of the two tribes would recount to one another all the events that had come to pass during the preceding year. Hole in the Day, the younger, was a handsome man, tall and symmetrically formed, with much grace of manner and natural refinement. He was an astute student of diplomacy. The Ojibways allowed polygamy, and whether or not he approved the principle, he made political use of it by marrying the daughter of a chief in nearly every band. Through these alliances, he held a controlling influence over the whole Ojibway nation. Rev. Claude H. Bolio said of him, Hole in the Day was a man of distinguished appearance and native courtliness of manner. His voice was musical and magnetic, 
and with these qualities he had a subtle brain, a logical mind, and quite a remarkable gift of oratory. In speech he was not impassioned, but clear and convincing, and held fast the attention of his hearers. It is of interest to note that his everyday name among his tribesmen was the boy. What a boy he must have been! I wonder if the name had the same significance as with the Sioux, who applied it to any man who performs a difficult duty with alertness, dash, and natural courage. The man applies to one who adds to these qualities wisdom and maturity of judgment. The Sioux tell many stories of both the elder and the younger hole in the day. Once when the boy was still under ten years of age, he was fishing on Gull Lake in a leaky birch bark canoe. Presently there came such a burst of frantic war-whoops that his father was startled. He could not think of anything but an attack by the dreaded Sioux. Seizing his weapons, he ran to the rescue of his son, only to find out that the little fellow had caught a fish so large that it was pulling his canoe all over the lake. "'Ugh!' exclaimed the father. "'If a mere fish scares you so badly, I fear you will never make a warrior.' It is told of him that when he was very small, the father once brought home two bear cubs and gave them to him for pets. The boy was feeding and getting acquainted with them outside his mother's birch bark teepee, when suddenly he was heard to yell for help. The two little bears had treed the boy and were waltzing around the tree. His mother scared them off, but again the father laughed at him for thinking that he could climb trees better than a bear. The elder hole in the day was a daring warrior, and once attacked and scalped a Sioux who was carrying his pelts to the trading post, in full sight of his friends. Of course he was instantly pursued, and he leaped into a canoe which was lying near by, and crossed to an island in the Mississippi River near Fort Snelling. When almost surrounded by Sioux warriors, he left the canoe and swam along the shore with only his nose above water. But as they were about to head him off, he landed and hid behind the falling sheet of water known as Minnehaha Falls, thus saving his life. It often happens that one who offers his life freely will after all die a natural death. The elder hole in the day so died when the boy was still a youth. Like Philip of Massachusetts, Chief Joseph the Younger, and the brilliant Osceola, the mantle fell gracefully upon his shoulders, and he wore it during a short but eventful term of chieftainship. It was his to see the end of the original democracy on this continent. The clouds were fast thickening on the eastern horizon. The day of individualism and equity between man and man must yield to the terrific forces of civilization, the mass play of materialism, the cupidity of commerce with its twin brother politics. Under such conditions, the younger hole in the day undertook to guide his tribesmen. At first, they were inclined to doubt the wisdom of so young a leader, but he soon proved a ready student of his people's traditions, and yet, like Spotted Tail and Little Crow, he adopted too willingly the white man's politics. He maintained the territory won from the Sioux by his predecessors. He negotiated treaties with the ability of a born diplomat, with one exception and that exception cost him his life. Like other able Indians who foresaw the inevitable downfall of their race, he favored a gradual change of customs, leading to complete adoption of the white man's ways. In order to accustom the people to a new standard, he held that the chiefs must have authority, and must be given compensation for their services. This was a serious departure from the old rule, but was tacitly accepted and in every treaty he made there was a provision for himself in the way of a land grant or a cash payment. He early departed from the old idea of joint ownership of the Lake Superior Ojibways, because he foresaw that it would cause no end of trouble for the Mississippi River branch, of which he was then the recognized head. But there were difficulties to come with the Leech Lake and Red Lake bands, who held aloof from his policy, and the question of boundaries began to arise. In the first treaty negotiated with the government by Young Hole in the Day in 1855, a surplus was provided for the chiefs aside from the regular per capita payment, and this surplus was to be distributed in proportion to the number of Indians under each. Hole in the Day had by far the largest enrollment, 
therefore he got the lion's share of this fund furthermore he received another sum set apart for the use of the head chief and these things did not look right to the tribe in the very next treaty he provided himself with an annuity of one thousand dollars for twenty years beside a section of land near the village of crow wing and the government was induced to build him a good house upon this land in his home he had many white servants and henchmen and really lived like a lord he dressed well in native style with a touch of civilized elegance wearing coat and leggings of fine broadcloth linen shirt with collar and topping all a handsome black or blue blanket his moccasins were of the finest deerskin and beautifully worked his long beautiful hair added much to his personal appearance he was fond of entertaining and being entertained and was a favorite both among army officers and civilians he was especially popular with the ladies and this fact will appear later in the story at about this time the united states government took it upon itself to put an end to warfare between the sioux and the ojibways a peace meeting was arranged at Fort Snelling, with the United States as mediator. When the representatives of the two nations met at this grand council, Hole in the Day came as the head chief of his people, and with other chiefs appeared in considerable pomp and dignity. The wives of the government officials were eager for admission to this unusual gathering, but when they arrived there was hardly any space left except next to the Sioux chiefs, and the white lady soon crowded this space to overflowing one of the sioux remarked i thought this was to be a council of chiefs and braves but i see many women among us thereupon the ojibway arose and spoke in his courtliest manner the ojibway chiefs will feel highly honored said he if the ladies will consent to sit on our side Another sign of his alertness to gain favor among the whites was seen in the fact that he took part in the territorial campaigns, a most unusual thing for an Indian of that day. Being a man of means and influence, he was listened to with respect by the scattered white settlers in his vicinity. He would make a political speech through an interpreter, but would occasionally break loose in his broken English, and wind up with an invitation to drink in the following words, Gentlemen, you pemmicans republicans come out and drink from eighteen fifty five to eighteen sixty four hole in the day was a well-known figure in minnesota and scarcely less so in washington for he visited the capital quite often on tribal affairs as i have said before he was an unusually handsome man and was not unresponsive to flattery and the attentions of women at the time of this incident he was perhaps thirty-five years old but looked younger he had called upon the president and was on his way back to his hotel when he happened to pass the treasury building just as the clerks were leaving for the day he was immediately surrounded by an inquisitive throng among them was a handsome young woman who asked through the interpreter if the chief would consent to an interview about his people to aid her in a paper she had promised to prepare hole in the day replied if the beautiful lady is willing to risk calling on the chief at his hotel her request will be granted the lady went and the result was so sudden and strong an attachment that both forgot all racial biases and differences of language and custom she followed him as far as minneapolis and there the chief advised her to remain for he feared the jealousy of some of his many wives she died there soon after giving birth to a son who was brought up by a family named woodbury and some fifteen years ago i met the young man in washington and was taken by him to call upon certain of his mother's relatives the ascendancy of hole in the day was not gained entirely through the consent of his people but largely by government favor therefore there was strong suppressed resentment among his associate chiefs and the Red Lake and Leech Lake bands, in fact, never acknowledged him as their head, while they suspected him of making treaties which involved some of their land. He was in personal danger from this source, and his life was twice attempted, but though wounded, in each case he recovered. His popularity with Indian agents and officers lasted till the Republicans came into power in the sixties, and there was a new deal. The chief no longer received the favors and tips to which he was accustomed. In fact, 
he was in want of luxuries, and worse still, his pride was hurt by neglect. The new party had promised Christian treatment to the Indians, but it appeared that they were greater grafters than their predecessors, and unlike them kept everything for themselves, allowing no perquisites to any Indian chief. In his indignation at this treatment, Hole in the Day began exposing the frauds on his people, and so at a late day was converted to their defense. Perhaps he had not fully understood the nature of graft until he was in a position to view it from the outside. After all, he was excusable in seeking to maintain the dignity of his office, but he had departed from one of the fundamental rules of the race, namely, let no material gain be the motive or reward of public duty. He had wounded the ideals of his people beyond forgiveness, and he suffered the penalty. Yet his courage was not diminished by the mistakes of his past. Like the Sioux chief, Little Crow, he was called the betrayer of his people, and like him he made a desperate effort to regain lost prestige, and turned savagely against the original betrayers of his confidence, the agents and Indian traders. When the Sioux finally broke out in 1862, the first thought of the local politicians was to humiliate Hole in the Day by arresting him and proclaiming some other head chief in his stead. In so doing, they almost forced the Ojibways to fight under his leadership. The chief had no thought of alliance with the Sioux, and was wholly unaware of the proposed action of the military on pretense of such a conspiracy on his part. He was on his way to the agency in his own carriage when a runner warned him of his danger. He thereupon jumped down and instructed the driver to proceed. His coachman was arrested by a file of soldiers, who, when they discovered their mistake, went to his residence in search of him. But meanwhile he had sent runners in every direction to notify his warriors, and had moved his family across the Mississippi. When the military reached the river bank, he was still in sight, and the lieutenant called upon him to surrender. When he refused, the soldiers were ordered to fire upon him, but he replied with his own rifle, and with a whoop disappeared among the pine groves. It was remarkable how the whole tribe now rallied to the call of Hole in the Day. He allowed no depredations to the young men under his leadership, but camped openly near the agency and awaited an explanation. Presently Judge Cooper of St. Paul, a personal friend of the chief, appeared, and later on the assistant secretary of the interior, accompanied by Mr. Nicolay, private secretary of President Lincoln. Apparently, the great humanitarian president saw the whole injustice of the proceeding against a loyal nation, and the difficulty was at an end. Through the treaties of 1864, 1867, and 1868 was accomplished the final destiny of the Mississippi River Ojibways, Hole in the Day was against their removal to what is now White Earth Reservation, but he was defeated in this, and realized that the new turn of events meant the downfall of his race. He declared that he would never go on the new reservation, and he kept his word. He remained on one of his land grants near Crow Wing. As the other chiefs assumed more power, the feeling of suspicion and hatred became stronger, especially among the Pillager and Red Lake bands. One day he was waylaid and shot by a party of these disaffected Indians. He uttered a whoop and fell dead from his buggy. Thus died one of the most brilliant chiefs of the Northwest, who never defended his birthright by force of arms, although almost compelled to do so. He succeeded in diplomacy so long as he was the recognized head of his people. Since we have not passed over his weaknesses, he should be given credit for much insight in causing the article prohibiting the introduction of liquor into the Indian country to be inserted into the Treaty of 1858. I think it was in 1910 that this forgotten provision was discovered, and again enforced over a large expanse of territory occupied by whites, it being found that the provision had never been repealed. Although he left many children, none seemed to have made their mark. Yet it may be that in one of his descendants the undaunted spirit will rise again. End of section 15 End of Indian Heroes and Great Chieftains by Charles A. Eastman 
Ohiesa.